Hi guys, it's uh, time for chapter one. We're going to study interactions in motion. This is chapter one of the course of matter and interactions. And I'm actually uh, in a bit of a bind here because I don't have a lot of time. So I'm going to have to rush through this a little more than I would normally like to. But uh, it turns out the old video somehow has sync issues after all these years. And uh, I don't know exactly how, but what are you going to do? So, we start with chapter one. First thing I want to point out is that this course is based on three fundamental principles. The first is the momentum principle, which we're going to begin in earnest in chapter two. It says that the change in the momentum of a particle over a period of time is equal to the net force acting on the particle. That's the degree to which the surroundings exert a net force on the particle or on the system. Uh, times the time over which that net force acts. And of course this principle is most accurate if the time interval is very small compared to the time over which the net force can change. So if the net force is not constant, we have to use a time interval that's small compared to the time it takes for the net force to change very much. So this is an approximate principle um, with, with that uh, restriction. The energy principle on the other hand is, is much more exact. It says that the energy of a system changes when the surroundings do work on the system or when heat is transferred in or out of the system. So we're going to use that principle to study changes in energy. And finally the angular momentum principle is the one that talks about how the thing rotates and how it spins. Angular momentum has to do with the rotation of a system and the and much like the momentum principle, the angular momentum principle relates the change in the angular momentum to the net torque acting on the system over a period of time. And again, if the net torque is not constant, the time interval has to be small compared to the time over which the torque changes very much. But the, what's interesting isn't the details of these three principles, but it's that you can encapsulate so much physics into three fundamental principles like that these three principles are going to last us pretty much the whole semester and we're going to be doing many many different systems with many many different behaviors but they all boil down all these various systems and behaviors and interactions and so on boil down to these three basic principles so if there's anything you learn in this course it's going to be what these three principles mean and how they work and what you can do with them so that's good that's going to be the focus also, we're going to be using a tool this semester called vPython that is a 3D animation and visualization tool. It's open source, and you can go and get it right now if you want to. It's at vPython.org. Um, I encourage you to download it, install it on your own personal computer, and you can use that to explore a variety of modeling tasks. We're going to be doing most of our modeling in class in a kind of a laboratory setting. But there may be times when I encourage you to try something out at home, and for that reason, it'd be nice if you had the tool there. So go ahead and download it and become familiar with it. In order to talk about matter and interactions, we have to discuss what kind of matter are we dealing with. Um, at the m sort of basic level, you know that the universe is made up of atoms. And so that's sort of a fundamental kind of matter we're going to deal with. Of course, you probably also know that atoms themselves are composed of electrons, protons, and neutrons. And you may know that protons and neutrons are actually not elementary, but have subcomponents called quarks and so on. Um, but uh, for the most part, most of the time, we'll be dealing with larger objects, that is, combinations of atoms. Atoms can combine to form molecules and solids, liquids, and gases and uh, we'll be dealing with those at various points in the course and of course th these materials can combine to form planets and stars and star systems and galaxies and and all of the visible universe so uh, all of the matter we handle can be thought of as atoms clumped together combined together in various ways to form different kinds of stuff and uh, pieces of matter interact with one another in a variety of ways, and we're going to study uh, several of them. But what happens when there is an interaction? Ha can, you, can you look at a piece of matter and see, just by observing it, whether or not it's undergoing an interaction at this time? The answer is you can. If you see the object just sitting there, not moving, 
not changing anything, then it's probably not interacting, at least not interacting very strongly. It's, it has no net interaction. It's in stable equilibrium, say. But, uh, but if you ch see it changing its speed, that means there must be an interaction of some kind with something. How could you detect a change of speed? Well, you could, you could take a series of snapshots at equal time intervals, and you could witness the position of the object at the, at the time of these different snapshots. And if you see the distance between one snapshot and the next snapshot changing with time, that means there's a change in speed. And so that means that the thing is undergoing an interaction. On the other hand, you could keep the distance constant, but change the direction along which the object is moving. That would also be indicative of an interaction of some kind. So if the speed is constant, but the direction of motion is changing, that also requires an interaction. And of course, uh, these two properties, direction and speed, are nothing other than the uh, elementary properties of the velocity vector. The velocity vector is a vector whose size is the speed and whose direction tells you which way the thing is going. And if uh, the velocity vector is not constant, that means there's an interaction. In fact, this is formalized through a, a thing called Newton's first law. Newton's first law basically says if the velocity vector is constant, then there's no interaction. If the velocity vector isn't constant, then there is an interaction. An object undergoing no interaction will have a constant velocity vector. That means it will move at a constant speed in an unchanging direction. Now there are other things interactions can do. They can cause changes in identity. You can change one kind of particle into another kind of particle, or they can change an object's shape. They can change its temperature. Um, we're going to postpone consideration of those kinds of changes until later in the semester. For now, we're going to focus on changes in motion. And so that's going to be uh, what we'll be doing for a, a few weeks. In order to describe motion, position, velocity, momentum, uh, force, and acceleration, we're going to need the concept of a vector. A vector is a mathematical object that describes how much how big a thing is and how in which way it points. So for example, how much velocity have you got? That's called the speed, the, st the amount of velocity, and the direction of the velocity is which way the vector points. And I've got some uh, resources you can look up to help understand that, uh, which I will point out here momentarily. We do need to be able to do stuff with vectors, like add and subtract them. We need to be able to multiply them by a number a scalar, which is not a vector, like three times a vector is a vector that points in the same direction, but it's three times the size. We need to be able to get the magnitude and direction of a vector given its components, and we need to be able to find unit vectors and direction cosines of vectors given their components. So we'll do that in the homework. We'll also do a little bit of that in class so you get an idea of how it works. And the notation we're going to be using is either the I hat, J hat, K hat notation with which you might be somewhat familiar, or the angle bracket notation um, where you put the three components inside uh, angle brackets separated by commas. Some of the quantities that we'll be using vectors for are position, the R vector, velocity, the V vector, P, the momentum vector, and capital F, the force vector. So these are and there are others. We're not done with that. There's an acceleration and I don't know, probably a dozen different quantities that are vector in character. But these are the main guys. And I have cooked up a vector video that you guys can go and look at. Uh, I put a URL up on ACE that you can click on if you don't feel like typing. But that is the URL. And uh, I hope you have fun with that if you decide to go take a look at it. Um, just a note on vector notation. If I have a vector that has uh, x component of 4 and a y component of 2. You could write that as 4i hat plus 2j hat, or you could just write it as 4, 2. And uh, if I have another vector with a x component of 1 and a y component of 3, you could write it as i hat plus 3j hat, or using the uh, angle bracket notation as angle bracket 1, comma 3. And if I add those two together, Notice you add the x components together and you add the y components together to get the resultant vector. Then they just add up to 5, 5. 
So that's an example. Let's, let's look at velocity as an example. There's this idea of average velocity. If I have a displacement, delta x, over some period of time, delta t, the average velocity is the ratio of delta x to delta t. Let's take an example. Let's say I have an object originally at x1, then it winds up at x2. The displacement is the difference between x1 and x2. And supposing that that takes some period of time, I divide by delta t and I get the average velocity as a vector that's equal in direction to the displacement vector but has a different size because you divide by the time it took. And so, uh, for example, let's say x1 is 5 comma 1 comma 0 and x2 is 8 comma 5 comma 0. What would delta x be? Well, delta x you get by subtracting x1 from x2 and you'd get 3 comma 4 comma 0. If the period of time was 3 seconds, you'd end up with a average velocity of 1, 1 and a third, and 0 as the x, y, and z components. And of course the units are going to be meters per second. So I really, if I had been paying attention, I would have put meter units on the position x1 and the position x2 and the displacement delta x. They should really have units of meters. But uh, I, I grabbed these slides from years ago, and apparently I wasn't as careful back then as I should have been. But it, it, it should be meters per second. OK, what about uh, a position update? Well, you can run this average velocity equation backwards. In other words, if you know the average velocity and you know the time, you can compute the new position given the old position. So let's say we know the old position is 5, 1, 0 meters. I should have meters there. Uh, and I know the average velocity is 1 and one, 1 and a third meters per second. And I know the duration of the time interval was 3 seconds. The idea is I can compute the displacement by multiplying the average velocity by the time interval, 3 seconds, to get the displacement. Then I can add the displacement to the initial position to get the final position. That's the idea. All right, so you can, you can use the initial and final position in the time to get the average velocity from the displacement, or you can get the new position if you know the average velocity in the time and the old position. So we're going to use that in the modeling because to figure out where a particle is at a later time, all we need to know is the average velocity over the time interval and the old position before at the beginning of the time interval. Now momentum is defined as that monstrosity. It's the mass times the velocity vector divided by this terrible square root. Now the thing is that terrible square root has a velocity divided by the speed of light in it. And if the velocity is much, much less than the speed of light, then 1 minus v over c squared is really very, very nearly equal to just 1. So for motions that happen at a very low speed, much lower than the speed of light, um, you can neglect the v over c squared and just treat that as mass times velocity. So for many problems where we're not dealing with relativistic speeds, where speeds are close to the speed of light, sometimes called relativistic speeds, then we can forget about the square root business and just use mass times velocity. But if there's a problem where something's going at half the speed of light or two-thirds of the speed of light, you're going to have to take that speed of light part into account to calculate the momentum. Let's do an example. In this case, let's say we have a particle moving with a speed of 3 comma 4 meters per second. In other words, it has x component of 3 meters per second, a y component of 4 meters per second, and a mass of 3 kilograms. How do we calculate the momentum? Well, we take the square root of the sum of the squares of the components of the velocity. That's um, Notice that's just the Pythagorean theorem. And we work out the velocity, or the speed, the magnitude of the velocity is 5 meters per second. Of course, 5 meters per second is much, much less than 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second, which is the speed of light. So we can forget about the square root in the relativistic correction to the momentum, and we can calculate the momentum as simply mass times velocity. So the momentum is 3 kilograms times the velocity, 3 comma 4 meters per second, and so the momentum is 9 comma 12 kilogram meters per second. To calculate the rate of change of momentum, I'd have to calculate the momentum at the beginning, the momentum at the end, 
subtract the two momenta and divide by the time, that would give me the rate of change of momentum. We're going to find out that that is nothing other than the net force. That'll be chapter two. But just so you see that we're not just calculating momentum for the fun of it. We need to know the momentum in order to determine what happens as a consequence of the interaction. So that's all I have for you for chapter one. I'll see you guys next time.